Um, <laughs> thank you very much for this opportunity to present to you this morning. And it really is about being positive about continence care. Um, in Glan I have no disclosures to make. I am I was self-funded and my institution paid for me to come today. I will try and speak slowly um, because I do have a very strong Scottish accent. <laughs> so hopefully um, you will understand me. Just to give you some idea of the Scottish population, um, it's around 5.3 million. Um, and Glasgow is actually the largest uh, area. It has an estimated population of 1.2 million, which is 22% of the Scottish population. 48% um, are male and 51, nearly 52% are female. In the current cost of providing products, we spend a phenomenal amount of money on pads alone. Nothing else. This is just containment products, pads. Um, and as you can see, the Scottish budget currently uh, stands at 14 million in excess. And Glasgow equates for 25% of the total Scottish budget. So therefore, you could see there was a reason for us to actually look at how we delivered continence cares within Glasgow particularly differently. And we then looked at the evidence building as we went forward in the redesign of the service. And I was involved with CARA and doing a postdoctorate. And the evidence from that really was the inspiration behind me doing what I did within Glasgow and redesigning the, the whole service. And really what we were looking at was using that evidence. But the main difference here was within the evidence, it was untreated women, older women. And here we're really looking at trying to deliver a self-management model towards women who were actually coming along to their GP and looking for some support. Um, so really what we looked at was re really looking at how we delivered a behavioural intervention group. And we were wanting to use the evidence, as I say, to apply this to practice, which was very important and a bugbearer for me. Lots and lots of research is done, but very little is actually implemented or seen as implemented into clinical practice. And therefore, I was really keen that this evidence was actually implemented as well. And we were looking to work with the groups to dispel the myths around incontinence, provide knowledge and education to empower patients, and use that self-management concept to, uh, to change profes professionals' approaches where they were more about support and facilitating self-management approaches. We carried out a, a six-month practice project uh, with 755 uh, patients, mm -hmm. and there was quite remarkable changes for me as a, self, as a service manager within the, the service. We reduced our... Uh, did not attend rates, so people who weren't turning up to clinics, there was a high percentage of DNA rates, 75%, we reduced them to 27%. And from a service manager's point of view, that's really important because that means there's clinic appointments not being used. Now these clinic appointments are getting used to actually provide better outcomes for, mm -hmm. for uh, patients attending the clinics. We also um, had 14% of cancelled uh, patients cancelling. Um, the good thing about that, again, was about the self-management aspect where patients were taking responsibility for the appointment they were given. And if they're unable to attend, they were actually phoning up and, and cancelling and reorganising a new, new appointment. And um, one of the main concerns for the clinicians <clears throat> was that if patients were coming along to a clinic, um, they were concerned that they, they may not have been um, screened for red flags, things that we'd be concerned about, uh, like... Um, blood in the urine or, you know, possible pelvic masses. Um, so we actually picked up 12% patients who were potentially at risk. They had been to their GP, they'd been referred to the clinic, and through our screening mechanisms, we picked up 12% of patients who were given a two-week appointment because they were considered as a high risk um, of something possibly more sinister going on um, within their symptoms. The main thing we brought from this experience was the patient's pathway is not linear. And one of the things we identified with surgical options were often the first port of call. Patients, when they went to GPs, thought that the surgery option was actually the only option available to them. There was nothing else could be done other than wear pads. And really what we are trying to do now is put the surgical option... Uh, well, it's no, it's, Something's happened there as well with me. But really about the self-management approach has been the main thing. 
We also developed pre-assessment clinics so we could fast track ladies into a pre-assessment clinic where there were um, a, bladder, a bladder scan and urinalysis carried out, really to make sure there was no um, red flags there and we could fast track if required. Um, we then provide a behavioural intervention group uh, where women are actually delivered with the education. This also allowed them to be empowered and informed about the choices available to them before they went to the clinical nurse specialist or indeed the physiotherapist if that was deemed the most appropriate route. And we all have also now taken the next step to look at pelvic floor training in groups is also where we are actually using that peer support uh, mechanism to try and encourage women to make the changes that they need and to also adhere to their um, care plan. So clearly self-management approaches is key. But as I say, really what we're looking for is to make sure that people don't actually go to the surgery option, the first option. So patient outcomes, what have actually happened with patients? Well, there was, an, there was significant improvement um, in leakage and symptoms. Um, we have actually improved the length of wait to access the service quite significantly. Most women were wait, waiting in excess to 18, 20 weeks to access the service. Most women are now accessing the service within four to six weeks, and often uh, within zero to three weeks. The satisfaction on the wait is very, very good. The environment they, they come into, they feel very supported. They think the talks are great and um, they're actually encouraged to make changes. And 87% of the ladies who we surveyed actually turned around and said yes, by coming to the groups, they actually were um, encouraged to make a change. And actually we are actually starting to find that ladies who are coming along to the clinic are actually coming along to tell us they don't need to come back mm. because they've actually made significant changes on their own. Um, overall, it comes to redesign from a service and organisation. Our organisation is absolutely delighted. We have actually managed to reduce a deficit of over £800,000. Uh, £800, and we currently stand at 90000 overspend. That's overspend. That's not underspend. And our organisation is absolutely delighted because That's the trend <laughs> on um, cost is actually going down. Um, we have equality checked the service as well, um, which wasn't done before. It was a hit and a miss whether you were actually treated sensitively for your um, equality issues. And patient satisfaction is 100%. Patients who come along absolutely thoroughly enjoy it. The downside for us, we have been victims of our own success. <laughs> when I started, we had um, an average of just over 3,000 patients being referred to our service, and that was new patients, not new patients who were already attending. We are now see seeing over 5,000 patients per annum uh, through our, our service, yet we are still able to cope with that with a four to six weeks with the same resources. So it's been a very cost-efficient and effective process that we've gone through. And also, I, I truly believe, as does the staff, that the outcomes for patients are far better too uh, than what they were before. What's the next steps really to build on our, our success? It's really about prevention rather than cure. And we're now actually getting funding to go forward to look at a public health um, campaign where we're actually looking to try and target and involve young people to be part of that campaign so that we're actually getting the message to younger people. Um, we believe that's the only way we're going to engage young people because um, we've thought about schools, etc. And young people don't really seem to be that interested. Um, so we thought if we actually encourage young people to be part of the campaign and do something theoretical, um, that that might help. And um, we're going to continue using the rehabilitative focus and use other service, uh, services to improve outcomes. So we're looking at how does our service sit with other like rehab services also, because one of the issues we're picking up within the primary care area is that you know we have a lot of functional incontinence. So how do we deal with that with our rehabilitation? services to avoid people having to jump to containment products? How do we actually encourage a full assessment, looking at aids and adaptations, and actually just fundamentals of getting to the toilet and mobilising to the toilet? We continue to look at new innovations. Um, we've just recently completed the TNS study with Joe Booth, um, and that's also been shown to be very cost effective, and we've, we're starting to introduce that um, within the service also. We continue to develop the research agenda. We recognise the evidence base is very important to actually develop the service. And we're also looking at how we actually work better with patients who have 
one to the end of the line and really are now having to live with incontinence and how do we actually make sure that they are actually living with incontinence, not just existing. Um, so we're actually looking at how we provide them with support, um, counselling uh, and actual ongoing um, ways of supporting them to actually live a meaningful life with their incontinence. And that's my talk. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. <laughs>